And then uh, over to James. So today we've got four titles ranking by James. Then following this, we'll have Peter Harrison talking about um, the handling. So I think the two go kind of hand in hand. Um, and we'll start off with James, uh, James Perrins on striking. So over to you, James. Thank you, Dave. Um, all right. I hope everyone can see this. Um, I made it very quickly at the late hours of last night. Um, so, I mean, I'm just, just a bit about me. Um, I'm sure I've met a lot of you, but in case you haven't met me, I'm James. I'm the ringing master at Christchurch St. Lawrence um, in the city. And I also do a lot of ringing at um, the two cathedrals. And if you're ever around, uh, you know, I always love to meet new people and um, it's always fun helping others. So, yeah. James, aren't you All also right, the so branch ringing what? master? I am also the branch ringing master as well. Yes. So, um, yeah, so I'm in charge of the striking competitions and arranging the branch practices, which is a lot of fun when um, we can have them. <laughs> so hopefully when everything normalizes, we'll be able to reorganize those, which, you know, everyone is always welcome to. Thank you, Mary Luke. Um, okay, cool. So striking, towards better striking. So what is striking? Striking is the equally spaced positioning of your bell amongst the other bells within one change or a sequence. So it is quite a fundamental part of ringing as a whole. Um, basically, anywhere you ever go, any tower in the world you ever go to, um, you'll always, if you have good striking, you'll always be appreciated um, for it. Um, people can ring lots of things. Like it, it is very like regardless to your method ringing ability. And so like, it doesn't matter if you could ring Bristol Max or the hardest thing imaginable. If you don't have good striking, it's quite noticeable. And people like other ringers will be quite aware of it. So I don't want to sound like that typical university lecturer who's like, this subject is the most important, but striking is pretty much one of the most important aspects to ringing. And if you were to ask most ringers, um, you come across like, what is the most important thing? They'll say striking is the most important thing. And, um, and yeah, and so yeah, bad striking sounds quite blotchy. Um, it's non-uniform and Again, yeah, this is regardless of what you're ringing. Um, a, little, a little myth that you sort of hear every so often people say is, um, and you hear it all the time, is people say after a bit of a bad ring, they're like, oh, it all sounds the same outside. Well, I think this is a bit of a lie. <laughs> so perfect ringing always sounds good, like regardless of what they're ringing. And so that always sounds the same. But I think there's a very big difference between um, bad striking ringing and good striking ringing and the untrained ear or a non-ringer will be able to pick up on this. And it's really something that you want to avoid, like especially like say with Sunday morning ringing, always, always aim for your best striking. I like, never do anything risky. Um, if, if, if things aren't working out, I, I'm a big believer of you stand it up and you start again because striking is very, very important um, just as a, as a whole. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, the better your striking is, the more you, you can be really, really proud of your uh, ringing ability. Um, one little quote uh, of Louise Salmon, who rings at Darling Point, is um, I remember her once saying, um, in reference to a couple of years ago, a local um resident of Darling Point said that at the weddings at Darling Point they they rang the bells automatically and then they rang the bells manually for every other day because basically for the weddings they would always get other ringers in who, who had a bit better striking and so I think that sort of goes to show that even non-ringers can really notice the difference between good striking and bad striking because you know there is there is people up there and um and yeah also, um, I shouldn't, um, before I waffle on too much, if anyone has any questions, please, please pipe up, um, say something. And um, yeah, and if, if you want me to repeat anything, I'll, I'll 
repeat myself. I, um, I've just taken the um, faces away from my screen because I get a bit nervous when everyone's looking at me. <laughs> but yeah, so question anything you don't understand. Um, yeah, cool. All right. <laughs> so this couldn't strike a cow's ass with a banjo is one of my favorite quotes in relation to striking. Um, it was said by a good friend of mine, a good friend of Sydney ringing, a man called David Barth. He used to say it all the time. He wouldn't say it to the person, but, you know, ring is always the polite. And, um, you know, we, we, you might notice someone who might not be striking as sort of accurately as you'd hope they'd be. And, um, but no one would say anything until like, you know, after the ringing's done. And then David would just say in most deadpan voice, he'd just be like, that person couldn't strike a cow's ass with a banjo. And it would just erupt with laughter. And it was, and it, it's, it's just, just a fun little And I think we lost you, James. Um, seem to have frozen. Um, had you had you heard my little anecdote about the uh, yes. the little quote? Okay, cool. <laughs> All right, I'll um, just move on. I really hope this doesn't happen again. <laughs> um, okay. This, I must uh, say, just one, one comment, James, in terms of people listening from the outside. Yeah. I was in, in Hyde Park once and the ringers were ringing at a wedding beautifully over in St Mary's and these people, group, large group of people picnicking, were absolutely mesmerised. They were just transported by the ringing at St Mary's Tower for the wedding. So they were, they didn't have any bell of bell ringing. They were from some country place and... Um, they, they really enjoyed it. So there you go. You, you're well, that's quite just right. it. I mean, it's, it really is something to be proud of and something to, like, people will always love. And it's, um, yeah, and it's, it's, it really is. And especially when people can tell you that, like, say, someone who isn't even a ringer at all, it really does sort of make your heart warm. Anyway, mm -hmm. I'll just share my screen again. Yeah. Okay, so um, the Devon Call Change Ringers um, are pretty much the best strikers in the world. And I'm sure some of you might have looked on YouTube as to um, different videos on you um, about good striking or like just ringing in general. And the, the ringers in Devon, they pretty much only ever ring call changes, but because they always focus on call changes and never like method ringing, their striking is actually very, very, very high quality. And, um, and yeah, and I wanted to show some examples to you. So, um, so I haven't lost anybody. <laughs> You're all still there. there. Yep, yeah. okay, cool. So this is an example of Devon call change ringing, which is very, very good quality striking. Is it playing, James? Yeah. Can you no, hear that? No. Okay. No, I can't just. Oh, actually, I think I know what I need to do. I just need to. You need to share your audio in the yeah. Zoom settings, James. Yeah. That's right. I um, I did that the first time around. All right. Um. Oh, what a disaster. <laughs> so. From about here. All right, can everybody hear this? Yes. So this is pretty much perfect. Uh, now they didn't have a hand stroke gap, but I'll I'll go into that later. But that is pretty much exactly what you want to strive for. 
Now, this is an example of very terrible striking. And I hope you can all notice why it sounds quite bad. And one, one of these unfortunate gentlemen um, actually loses control of his belt. But yes, as we'll see. So the, so the sound is really um, inconsistent. There, there are bells ringing together and crunching on top of each other. And there are bells that have large spaces. And um, yeah, so that, that's quite an example of not very good striking. Um, and then this third one, which is a little bit tricky, but for the point of it, this is very good ringing with the exception of one bell. Now, if you see this ringer here, um, I don't actually know these people at all, so hopefully I don't get angry emails tomorrow or something, but um, he, this person is ringing the fifth and I want everyone to really focus on them because they're a bit quick. And other than that, this ringing is perfect, but if you can really, really focus on this person's bell, the five, you'll be able to notice that he his striking is a bit poor all right All right, and I'll, I'll just do it one more time, just so, um, just in case you missed it. But he, he's definitely, there are a few sort of zidums when he is hunting over other bells. That was one, that was another. That was another. That was another. But yeah, so I guess I guess the point I'm trying to make here is um, it, it really is the fine details. Um, you know, there, there's the extreme. You have absolutely perfect um, striking and you have absolutely terrible striking. And um, even when, you know, when, when you're advancing quite well, like there's always a good need to try and um, adjust your striking to always improve because um, it's one of those things that you're always working on. Um, does anyone have any questions? Like, is this all making sense so far? Or is, it, feel free, please please do ask if there's anything that doesn't make sense or if I've um, brushed over something. All fine, James. Okay. But um, sometimes I might just, um, just look at something and think I've said it, but I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> so um, what can you do to improve your striking? Uh, there's a few things. And um, firstly, this might not be the most important thing, but handling your bell is important. So um, it might seem obvious because, you know, we all need to handle a bell to be able to strike amongst others in call changes or plane hunt, but um, you need to have a competent style or a style that you are competent in adjusting to be able to make those fine motor skills to adjust your striking amongst the other bells. Um, yeah, it is just like the fine tuning, the tuning of a guitar. Like you can just have the most minuscule of adjustments, but it greatly improves the sound. And, um, and that's what you want, you know, you, you, wanna, you wanna be like those Devon call change ringers. Um, one thing which I always tell my learners all the time is, um, to, to improve your striking is, is set your bell 20 times, hand stroke, back stroke, because that way, you know, you always want to be in control um, of your bell. And um, yeah, and once you've done that on one bell, then move to the next bell and do 20 times on that bell. But I don't want to talk too much about handling because 
Peter's probably going to do a very good job about that. So that's, that's the first thing that sort of can help you. Listening. Now, listening is very important. Um, ringers are, ringers can ring priorly by hearing or priorly by um, seeing, but listening will always probably be the more important um, <coughs> sense to improve your striking. Oh, dear. How do I go back? Um, so being able to listen to your bell amongst other bells is very, very important, you know, and as I say here, you know, a chef, a good chef will taste their food, a good ringer should be able to hear their bell. Um, plenty of people can, can, will say that they can't hear their bells, and th that's nothing to be sort of ashamed about or like feel like you're doing wrong. Um, but I guess like quite crucially, um, there is a difference between listening and hearing, because uh, an experienced ringer and a beginner ringer, they're both hearing the same things, but one is listening to, to something that, that's gonna help them while the beginner you know, is less aware of those, those things. Um, and yeah, and, and so being able to hear your bell amongst other bells is, is quite important. And so yeah, and so what can you do to be able to listen to your bell amongst other bells? Um, Always, always start on the smaller numbers. You know, ringing on six is so fundamental. It's such a good number of bells to learn anything on, whether it's call changes or method ringing or plain hunt. And um, yeah, and so if you do struggle to hear your bell, um, try and ring the tenor or the treble as much as possible because the two, those two bells are very distinguishable. Um, you know, uh, it's quite standard for you, for uh, a beginner to ring the treble quite a bit because, you know, they are the lightest bell and, and yeah, and, and most trebles are quite easy to ring rather than tenors. A lot of tenors can be quite hard to ring. Um, but yeah, and so, and or, or even like, if you really are struggling, like even just crease the number of bells, like ring on four, like hear your bell amongst three other bells. Um, because it really is important that you, you can sort of hear your bell. Um, even if you are a visual ringer, if you can hear your bell, just, just to be sure that you are right, um, that you haven't sort of clashed or like made a, a da -dum, uh, like a clip, as they say, um, because that is quite important. Because if you can't really distinguish your bell, you, you will always make those clips and clashes, which will lead to sort of bad striking. Um, ring lots of call changes. Call changes is, it is so fundamental and it's, you know, it's, it's fun. Like we all ring call changes. And um, I, I put this next one in. I, I strongly think that conducting call changes is very, very helpful because the more you do conduct call changes, the more you understand the positioning of the bells around you. And, um, and I sort of, I want to sort of, you, everyone should feel happy or like easy to go to their ringing master and be like, hey, Joe Blogs, um, can I call call changes? I don't know what I'm doing, but can I just give it a go? Because you, you'll definitely pick up on things and you'll pick up on what how bells should sound when you call them to swap in a position. Um, you know, you'll probably make a few mistakes too, like if you've never done it before, but I think it would go a long way to improve your listening ability of the bells around you. And Anyone who can ring call changes is able to conduct call changes. So I, I'm pretty sure. Um, um, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's it's something that most people here would be able to do if they um, if they um, wanted to. Um, have, am I still with you all? Is um, I haven't disappeared or anything? <laughs> no, all good. Okay, cool. Right. <laughs> also, any, any questions? Any questions at all or anything? Um, all right, on to the, the next slide. Uh, the next thing that could help you is being able to see the other bells. So um, I personally am quite a visual ringer. I, I rely a lot on my um, ability to see other ringers to, to be able to see their ropes moving up and down in a, in a ringing chamber. And, um, and it's always basically impressed me, um, other ringers who are very visual, uh, very, um, reliant on the hearing to be able to ring. 
Um, so it's it's sort of a misnomer because there are, there are blind ringers out there, and that is entirely possible, and they and they can be amazing strikers. But it's definitely just another little factor that could help you on your way, like another little piece of that jigsaw puzzle that could just help you to improve your striking a little bit. Because um, yeah, quite simply, if your bell rope, yeah. It, um, be, being able to see and hear your bells concurrently, if you are following someone, your rope should as well. And um, it's just another little thing to think about. Um, yeah, try and see all the bell ropes in the same field of view. Um, and don't, don't overlook. Um, it's quite a natural um, thing where you know, you're learning and, and someone says, you should try and look for the bells. And you're like, what does that mean? Uh, and you, you know, you try really hard to look for them, but if anything, overlooking is, is not the answer. Sort of keeping your head as still as possible and sort of using your sort of periphery to see as many bells as possible will do a lot more to be able to see everybody at once. And if you look at any video on YouTube of really good quality ringing, you'll notice that their heads always stay still and it's their eyes that move just just a little bit, um, because like no one's looking at all bells at once. Like you just physically can't do it, but it's all there in your periphery, um, which is the best thing about a, a, a circle. <laughs> like the fact that we that, um, ropes are always in a circle because then it is able to see everybody from any position. But yeah, so being able to see the bells definitely will help to improve your striking um, rhythm. So rhythm is, it's a tricky one. So it's basically the ability to be able to move into a place without knowing exactly who you are following. Um, rhythm sort of comes into effect more so when you're hunting or in method ringing, as opposed to call changes. However, um, it is still a very important thing that you should be aware of because sometimes when you see people try and ring sort of hard methods without a sense of rhythm, you, you can really notice it and they, they just seem to be ringing at a different speed as opposed to everybody else. And it does take time. It is a little bit tricky, but it's, it's important. And um, one good technique I find where you notice rhythm the most is when you go to a bell tower that is very different to your own bell tower. So you, you might ring at a tower that has a light ring of bells if you go to ring at a tower that has a heavy ring of bells, you'll find that they might ring a lot slower and you really need to work on that rhythm to slow down your pace and ring at the same speed as everybody else and vice versa. And um, so I think rhythm really develops where you, you visit other towers and you really um, experience um, the ringing speed and yeah, the ringing speed of everybody around you because like speed can change. It, it can even change at your own tower, but not so much. Um, cool, uh, the use of simulator. Simulators are good for lots of things, including striking. And yeah, it really does develop your ability to listen and to a smaller degree, see your bells. Um, I'm sure a lot of us have heard of these apps like Mobile and Abel and Virtual Bell Free. But if you haven't, they're, they're very useful tools and they really do help with your positioning amongst other bells and that there's a lot to learn there really is a lot to learn and you're never going to go wrong um especially you know if you're on a flight somewhere and you've got literally nothing else to do like it's definitely a good a good um time to <laughs> i'm sure there's a better say <laughs> um cool other things to be aware of so these are sort of the exceptions to everything I've kind of said, <laughs> but um, some of us might be aware, some of us might not, but ringing bed bells is, it takes a different sort of, it, it feels a bit different to strike compared to smaller bells. If you ring a small bell, you need to hold up very wide of a big bells. And if you ring a big bell, you need to ring a lot closer to smaller bells. And, um, and, and if you're in the middle, you're sort of halfway in between if you're ringing sort of the four or five in a, in a ring of eight. Because um, that you, you really need to put that physical um, effort or that, that knowing into moving your bell to, to so the sound still 
the final sound sounds consistent. Um, odd struckness. Um, odd struckness is when a clapper is a little bit shifted to the one side. And so it means that your bell is sounding too soon or too late than it should be. And so basically it's almost like the bell has bad striking without anyone even ringing it, which sounds kind of weird. So um, a good ringer would be able to counter adjust that by um, if, if this bell would be quick at handstroke, this ringer ringing this bell would then think, oh, let's ring handstroke a bit slower. So it doesn't ruin the striking of the round. Handstroke gap. So handstroke gap is important. I mean, it's quite a, it, it's, it's, it's a common standard. So especially in Sydney ringing or the branch ringing or even just ANZAB, you always have a handstroke gap and that is considered part of your striking um, overall. Like you, you must ring with a little pause before you ring your handstroke just to really sort of divide up the sound. And I know this is a little bit contrary to that amazing Devon call change ringing because they didn't have a handstroke gap. But I would say it's, it's, it is a standard more than a, a rule. I mean, if we all decided we didn't want to have a handstroke gap, I think that would be fine. But, you know, we would still have to work on our striking. And so it, it sounds quite bad if some people are leaving a handstroke gap and some people are not. So um, the standard is in Australia is um, to always have a handstroke gap. So always, always do that as much as you can. And um, yeah, and, and I think we should probably talk more about striking to each other. I think people can get a bit hesitant to say um, if someone else is sort of striking, that's a little bit lacking. And some people can get quite sort of defensive if some were to say, oh, you know, I think your striking was a bit bad, especially if they might've been a ringer for a long time. But it, it's sort of a, a conversation that I think should be open and should be had. And, you know, it, it's coming from a sense that it, everybody wants to improve, not like, oh, I'm trying to attack you. So I think if someone were to say, oh, um, you know, I think you've, you, you might've been a bit slow at backstroke. I think you should listen rather than sort of counter argue straight away and be like, no, you don't know what you're talking about, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> because, um, I mean, I was taught by my dad, Bill, and for years, like, he just had this cough, which was like a specific sound that every time I made a mistake or, like, was a bit, my striking was a bit bad, he would just sort of cough in that way. And it, it really sort of got me. <laughs> and so much that, like, now, years later, um, whenever he coughs and he just happens to make that sound, like, it might not be even in a ringing chamber. It's, it's so, like, electrifying to me. It just sort of sends me off I'm like oh is something wrong with my ringing even though I'm not in the bell tower but um but yeah having having these discussions about striking is really really good and if someone just turns around and they're like hey I think your, your leading was a bit quick just just listen or like you know work it out and see like where where, where it's all at um yeah and it is possible like you know some of you might be listening to this and thinking oh I just I've tried this a lot, but I just don't know what to do anymore. And, you know, I might've said all these things that you've all heard already, but it is possible and striking, you know, it, it, it happens. Like it really, really does. And, um, and yeah, I think if you are all of a sudden able to notice someone else's good striking or bad striking or mediocre striking, I think you will be on your way to improving your own striking because you're aware of this um, standard that, you know, that we're all striving for. And yeah, and fundamentally, my last point, you should always be more proud of your striking ability than your method ringing ability. Because at the end of the day, it is always your striking that is judged more so than your method ability. And um, that's, that's it, everybody. That's my little presentation. Thank was there any James? questions? Thanks, James. That's good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions for James before we uh, move on? Oh, James. Yeah? Richard, Richard suggested that every tower should have a banjo award. <laughs> oh, yeah. As in, is this for the, is this for the dance of the group? Or <laughs> okay. Well, maybe. Well, um, I'm sure we can mention that at our next meeting. <laughs> But um, it was it was a good joke. Like when 
when David said that. <laughs> but um, yeah, it was always in good light. <laughs> um, I hope I hope I didn't. Um, yeah, sorry about the pauses and the internet delays, and I hope everything else made sense. But uh, thank you all for listening. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you. very difficult thank subject to do thank theoretically. Um, yeah, <laughs> it really. Uh, <laughs> it's like our next topic, which is um, which is Peter Harrison talking about handling. So uh, just give me two seconds.